If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. This morning's passage is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Working together with Him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike. Hey, before we get going here, I just want to mention that the uh, food distribution distribution's doing very well. Um, we, we do need uh, specific items of food. So we'll put out more information during the next few weeks on that for you, okay? Um, so let's get going. As a kid, I used to dream of winning the lottery. Yeah, I did. I did. Five bucks was big money to a Midwestern boy in the 70s. But I could imagine a five with four or five zeros behind it. And the quickest way to it was the lottery. But I was too young to play, way too young. Another thing I'd imagine in those days was some unlucky bloke who actually bought the winning ticket, but then lost it. Are you seeing a connection here? You're a kid, you're getting reprimanded for losing things. I thought, I thought that would have to be the worst, to buy the winning ticket and then lose it to have the riches almost in your hands and then lose them, to lose them through miscare or poor judgment or ignorance or disorganization or, in our parlance, worldly thinking. Paul says something like this in verse 1 of chapter 6. We appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Don't lose or miss the riches of Christ through miscare or ignorance. The riches of Christ have been placed to your hands now. Reconciliation, salvation, now is the time. Your ticket, your passport, your ship to the new world has come. Now, uh, in Greek, just before I say this in Greek, the, the word for world and earth, basically the same. Cosmos can be translated both, both ways. Tain gain, the earth, is usually translated the earth, but you could get away with the world. Uh, so, and what is the actual new world then? The new world is God in Christ. The new atmosphere is the kingdom. America, the great land, when it was settled, believed by many of the pilgrims and Puritans to be the actual promised land. Many of them actually believed this was the new Israel. It was the promised land, the physical promised land. But America, the great land, then, was a shadowy imprint of the true new world, the true new earth. But we have lost her through miscare, poor judgment, ignorance, disorganization, poor leadership, worldly thinking, and sheer stupidity. But we can never lose the new creation, the new creature, or the new life in Christ. For Christ will not permit it, not because we're not capable of losing it. We're very capable. We're very able to lose it. But Christ shall not permit it. Christ shall always protect it and guarantee it. Christ guarantees your new life. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Now, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your grace 
your amazing grace, your real grace, your authentic grace, your true grace, your grace which pervades every aspect of our lives, common grace for all and special, special grace in Jesus Christ for the saved. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you. Lord, please help us to understand today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, our title today is pretty simple. Calling, calling now. Calling, calling now. You know when your phone keeps ringing and keeps ringing and finally it just keeps ringing and you're compelled to answer it. It just keeps ringing so many times or the person calls back and you're compelled to answer it. Our title is Calling, Calling Now. Point one is authentic or real grace. That's verse one. And point two is now is the day of salvation. That's that's uh, verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 6. Today in Christ is the day to realize. Today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, not 10 years ago, not 30 years ago, not 80 years ago. Today is the day in Christ to realize, to realize that the day and time of reconciliation and salvation has come. Not, don't worry about the potluck next Thursday. Don't worry about, you know, the meal at the restaurant with your friends later. Don't worry about Christmas 2024, but today. Today is the day to realize that now is the day and time of reconciliation and salvation. So then, point one, real or authentic grace. Please read verse one with me, will you? Uh, working together with him, capital H there, working together with him then, we appeal, we appeal, tough to translate there, but that's, that's fair. We appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, these verses are, they're a little bit debated by scholars. Uh, some think that it means we work with God. Steve? Some think it means we live with God. Imagine that, Lit, working with God, actually working with God. Some think, though, others more cautiously, that it means we work with other Christians. Again, both are right. This is not an either or, but a both and. Going back, just two verses were representatives, ambassadors for Christ, at least the mature in Christ, the presbumen are. This implies at some level, whether direct or indirect, working with Christ. For how else can a representative know the mind of Christ? But the scripture says we have the mind of Christ. So it is undeniable that verse 1 does actually mean at least that the mature in Christ work together with God. And these mature in Christ, like Paul, are appealing to the less mature, like many of those in Corinth, not to receive the grace of God in vain. Uh, this is like, you've got kids, right? This is like when you call your kids not to waste their money, or not to waste their food, or not to waste their time. Paul is calling the less mature in the faith not to waste the grace of they have been given. Now, uh, just for a second, I'm going to go back just for a second. It says working together there with him. Uh, can anybody else think of a place in the scripture where it's actually said, work together with God? That clear? Uh, the Greek word there is... Uh, Syngine, uh, we derive our word synergy. 
in English from it. Sin means uh, with. Gain is a derivative of the word ergon. Ergon means to work, to labor, where you might have heard something with the root ergon is an ergonometer. You ever heard of that? I used to row in college, and it was measured on a rowing machine. It was called an ergonometer, right? It was, yeah, rowing's hard work, 2,000 calories an hour at the max, six times the swimming. You can burn 10,000 calories during a practice. Want to lose some weight? Go row. Um, but but sin guy means to work together with, to work together with. So, so what's being said here is to work together with, working together with God, Paul says, Paul says, and his fellows, Paul says, we then call you, we appeal you not to waste the grace of God. Now, what is the grace of God? Some of your commentaries will insist upon the narrow definition of unmerited favor. This is a good starting place, especially for special grace in Jesus Christ, but it is also an overly narrow definition. Here, the grace of God relates directly to what has come just before. So think about what has come just before in the passage. That's the grace of God. It is reconciliation, but not limited to that. And then especially in verse 21, if you'll read verse 21 of 5 with me. This is the grace of God right here in our passage being referenced. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, working together with him. So you see, because of Christ and the grace in Christ, we can actually work together with God. That's why you don't see a reference like this in the Old Testament. Because without the, the, the uh, mediation, the direct mediation of Christ, it is not possible for you to be a co-worker with God. Think about the level, the level of grace you've been given in ministry to be a co-worker with God, to be a co-worker with Jesus Christ. Another thing to say here about this verse 21, we said it before, is that in other words, grace in Jesus Christ is expressly delivered through the substitutionary sacrificial death of Christ and its effects. Everything in the Christian life is by grace, and everything wrought by God in 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21 is by grace, but the focal point of grace being talked about in verses 1 and 2, the focal of 6, the focal point of grace here most especially becomes Christ's sacrifice and substitutionary action on our behalf. The sacrifice and substitution, as well as one of its effects, the righteousness imputed to us. So again, because of the righteousness imputed to us through Christ, we can work with God. Are you catching it? The righteousness of Christ flows into this working together with God. You can see that as 21 transitions to 1 and 2. Sinner guide to work with. We can work together with God only because of Christ's sacrifice and the righteousness imputed to us. This translates us to a new state, a new condition, a new atmosphere. We are, as said earlier in 2 Corinthians, a new creature, a new creation. The new creature, the new creation can work with God, can work together with God, sharing in Christ's priesthood. A person can work with God who has been reformed 
and regenerated from the fall. Now, while Paul says, while we mature, while we elders, while we seniors in the faith do this, He says, we also appeal to you the less mature not to receive the grace of God in vain, not to waste it. Indeed, the less mature are destined for more maturity. As a 20-year-old one day becomes a 40 or a 50-year-old. Paul is calling again and again. You know, one of the best things uh, that can happen to you personally is, to, is through self-reflection, the grace of God and prayer, and scriptural study, to have an accurate reflection of where you are on the spectrum of faith. You, you don't get saved and then, and then you're a mature Christian. It doesn't work that way. You get saved and you're... I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, okay? Don't... Don't, don't take this the wrong way. But you get saved and you're a baby Christian. And then you become a child Christian. And then you become a young adult Christian. And then you become a mature Christian. And then by God's grace, you become a senior Christian. There's a progression. If you need a scriptural basis for this, it's sanctification by the Holy Spirit. That's an ongoing process. right? So to know where you are. I knew when I was uh, brought onto and invited to be by the congregation on the deacon board at First Baptist, uh, I don't know how many years ago, almost 20 years ago, first of all, I was one of the youngest guys out of 39. Most of them were over 70. That was number one. But secondly, I knew just in my own faith and my scriptural understanding, although I was teaching at the time many classes, but I knew I was way behind many of these men way, way behind in my maturity of faith. So my job was to listen to them, right? That was my job, and I I fulfilled my job. And so this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, you less mature in the faith. Do not waste the grace you've been given. He's calling again. He's saying you received real grace in Jesus Christ. Don't take it for granted. Don't let it be in vain. Don't live in vain. You have received authentic grace. Now, if you look with me, we're at point two in the sermon now. And verse two, now is the day of salvation. And the key word here is now. And the reason we know the key word here is now is because in, in the back of verse 2, you see, behold, now is the favorable time. And then you see, behold, now is the day of salvation. That word behold in Greek, it's kind of a, middle, it's a late Middle English word, behold, for us. It's an outdated word. We don't use it. But they still translate it that way because of King James. But what, what it would mean in English today is look. Stop and look. Look real hard. It's a do in Greek. It means freeze frame. It means stop. Stop everything you're doing and look. You know, the way that you would if you're about to walk in front of a car. You stop everything that else is going on and you look. You look. Or the way, or the way that, uh, you know, you would look as, Ma- as uh, Michael Jordan was making, you know, the game-winning shot at, in verse 7 of the finals. You stop everything you're doing and you look. Right? Now. Now, now. So this is about now. Now Paul's appeal becomes more direct with regard to the time element. Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Please read uh, verse 2 with me. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Then Paul says, behold, it do, stop and look. Stop and look. Now is the favorable time. Stop and look. Now is the day of salvation. The failures of uh, mankind, I probably don't need to tell you this, are as tall as the towers of Babel. 
which resulted in the separation of language. The reason that we do this translation thing that you hear me doing is because of man's pride and that language was separated. That's what the Bible teaches us. Always fallen man is self-absorbed, self-aggrandized, and driven to power, trying as a creature to become a distorted picture of the creator, trying always to lift himself into vaulted idolatry, even like images on coins or selfies. Verse 2 adroitly teaches us to work together with God and other Christians rather than not receiving the grace of God. So, there's, so you see, there's, there, there's a contrast here. One thing is, is receiving the grace of God and working with other Christians, working with God, working with other Christians. The other is not receiving the grace of God and not working with other Christians. The reason to do this and the means of doing this, working together with God, are elucidated in the quote from Isaiah 49. This first part is a quote from Isaiah 49, 49.8, I think. In a favorable time, I listen to you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Paul makes clear now is the favorable time, now is the day of salvation, the time is now. In Isaiah 49, these words are to the servant of the Lord for the time of releasing Israel from the Babylonian exile, releasing from bondage. This was a day of salvation. So this first quote is showing a day of salvation in ancient Israel's history. But what happens next is that Paul makes much more clear that the time, the day, when God through Christ reconciled us and the world to himself is the day of salvation. That was a day of salvation in Christ when God reconciled the world to himself. That was the day of salvation. The true hearing of the gospel is the day of salvation for a person. Does that make sense? The true hearing of the gospel is the day of salvation for a person. It is the ultimate day of salvation in Christ, through Christ, and by Christ. God continues to invite unbelievers into this favorable time when the gospel is preached and they are invited to receive Christ and be reconciled to God. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose. This is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the releasing from bondage, sin's bondage. And we also have the blessings, the blessing of looking forwards towards the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when salvation, capital S, will come to full consummation. Now, I, I just want to think briefly, and we're, 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 we're start. So we've, we've come up kind of to, if in the sermon, we've come up kind of to the top of the hill. You've had to think a lot, I hope, think a lot about what's being said, understand it in an explanatory fashion. Now we're going to kind of go down the hill on skis. I just want you to think briefly about Some of the things, what some of the things said or called for in verse 2 mean for your life. Does it mean that you're walking on hot sand and need to run? Does it mean that you're sailing on the ocean and need to let the sails out because the wind has come? Does it mean you've been flying on the worldly ship and need to parachute out of it in Christ? Well, first of all, by way of self-check, it means that if you have received Christ, if you have agreed with Christ, don't let this be in vain. Don't let this be for nothing. As a new creation, live, listen to me now, as a new creation, live in God's grace. Live in God's grace. 
You already live by God's grace. The only way anyone lives is by God's grace, saved or not. One common grace, the other special. But, but what I'm saying to you now is, as a new creation, live in God's grace. This is important, truly. Urgent, not just important, urgent. Do it now. Now is the day. Uh, for those of you, and we have a few, from, for, for those of you who preach and or teach or share the gospel through ministries you serve in, the time is also quite urgent. This verse makes that clear. The time is also quite urgent. If you are about it now, then persevere. But if you're busy learning and being equipped after having been called and knowing your gifting, don't waste time. There's no time to waste. If you were called to be a minister, a pastor, it's time to go to seminary today. It's time to get enrolled today. If you're enrolled, it's time to finish as soon as possible. The time is now. The time is not, okay, I was called to be a pastor, or I was called to be a missionary, or I was called to lead this, this uh, ministry, and I'll do it in 10 years. I'll do it in five years. I'll do it in 15 years when all this other stuff in my life is worked out. That's not how ministry works. You stop what you're doing, you do it now. Whatever it is, all the other stuff takes a back seat to the call that God has on your life. They say, uh, they say, don't put off until tomorrow what can be done today. Uh, now, I, I, I'm not making a political statement here in any way, so I hope nobody will think that, and hopefully by the end of this you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. Uh, the Nazis thought most people are stupid or unteachable. I don't know if you knew this, studying Nazi doctrine. They believed about 3% of the population was educatable. That's it. The rest, no hope. And those are Germans, right? They're referring to their own people, right? I don't agree with that. I don't agree that most people are stupid. I think most people are smart. However, the teaching or training you give someone should match their natural talents and their gifting. For example, you don't worry about teaching kids who have tr trouble in second or third or fourth grade learning their multiplication tables, you don't teach those kids and worry about teaching those kids trigonometry, right? That's not a good use of time, right? Somebody who can't master their multiplication tables by fourth or fifth grade is very, very unlikely to ever be able to learn tri trigonometry or calculus. It's just not a good use of time. So it seems to me that the Nazis define culture and education too narrowly and therefore deduce that most people are not teachable. In any case, while I don't agree, I do not agree that most people are stupid or unteachable, I do assert that most people are lazy, particularly when left to their own devices, their natural devices. Indeed, without habits, training, and education, whether academic or military, the overwhelming majority of people would be very, very lazy. This is coming. This is one thing with AI that people aren't even thinking about. The level of, of, of laziness, new laziness, that's going to insert into our society. But many people are still lazy even after receiving training, habits, and education. That's one reason government systems tend not to work when compared with private enterprise. Because government systems run by administration, whereas private business runs by rewards and penalties. And rewards and penalties are more able to coerce someone not to be lazy. My point is this. Paul is making it clear that the faithful must avoid laziness. That they must learn and not be lazy. Look with me carefully. 
if you, you, if you think I'm off track and I haven't seen something like this commentary, but it's so obvious. Look carefully. Working together with God. Working together with God, says verse 1, and other people, right? Other Christians. We appeal to you not to waste the grace of God. How is it wasted? Very often through laziness. Verse 2. Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Right? What is now? What is doing something now? That's the opposite of laziness. Set yourself to your Christian labors. Set yourself to your Christian ministry now. Work now. Don't wait. And Paul is teaching us this so that we won't live a life of faith in vain. It's, it's very similar to Jesus. Remember the parable of, of, of the talents with Jesus, right? The, 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 the Lord, Jesus Christ, it means, the master, the Lord. He goes on a long journey, right? He sets his servants over his household. He gives, he gives one guy five talents. The guy works. He makes five more. He gives another guy two talents. The guy works, he makes two more. The Lord says to both of those, well done, good and faithful servant. He gives a third guy one talent. The guy buries it in the ground. The guy complains about his master. He said, I knew you were a hard master. I knew you plant where you didn't sow. I know you push things too hard. I knew you were a hard master. So I put, I put your talent in the ground. Here, have your talent back. And the Lord casts out that worthless servant, the lazy one. Most new pastors, most new ministers, and I've seen this so many times, fail because they're lazy. Period, full stop. Most people in seminary fail because they're lazy. No one called to ministry fails because they have not received adequate grace. So it can't be that. Anybody God calls to ministry, he's going to give adequate grace. He's going to give the means for them to accomplish their ministry. So it can't be that. It can't be. It's impossible. A good mentor, a good seminary, teaches a student not only theological facts and doctrine, but also habits which preclude laziness. This is now more important than ever. New pastors tend to like shortcuts, recognition, and easy success. What's needed is exactly the opposite. Hard work, dying to self, and perseverance. Now, by way of analogy to your ministry in your life, what's holding you back personally from the ministry you've been called to? What is holding you back personally? It's not grace. It shouldn't be others. Paul says that in the next verse. Usually what holds us back is what's in verse 2. Usually what holds us back is not recognizing the importance of time. Time is valuable. Time is the most valuable thing. The time that God gives us is, well, I don't want to say the most valuable. The time that God gives us is, is, is one of the most valuable things that, that we have. It's definitely much more valuable than money. Much more valuable. What would you rather have? Time with your children or money with your children? If you tell me money, I think you're missing something. Time. We have to recognize the importance of time. That every day is a blessing. And that today is the favorable time. Today is the day of salvation in Christ. May God open our ears to his word. Let us call our kids back to faith in Jesus Christ. Let us call this nation back, us Christians, not just here, let us call this nation back back to faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the grace you've given us. We thank you for 
the right standing you've given us such that we can work together with you. You enable all of our work, every bit of it. There's nothing that any of us can do in the kingdom without your help. Thank you, Lord, for this grace. Help us to do our part, which is to be faithful, dutiful, and yes, even hard laboring, even hard working servants. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for your love. Help us to know that now, today, is the time of salvation, and now, today, is the time for us to utilize the grace that you've given us in ministry. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.